So we're going to talk right now about another really great uh, uh, person who's just come from um, rising up. So, so to speak, somebody who I have only known for a very brief time. It's uh, GSOW. We talk about it a lot here in in Skeptic Camp. We've been talking a lot about it. Not necessarily so much because they're Wikipedia editors, which they are, and they and they are contributing in a really remarkable way, but also because what happens when you become a Wikipedia editor or join the GSOW or the Gorilla Skeptic Project, which is totally different from the GSOW project. That's more that focuses on psychics. Is that you're introduced to so many people, your world expands, not only in friendship wise, but people who are also doing other things that you can join in and be involved in. And this person who's coming up next, Adrian Hill, is one of those people who she came into the GSOW project, which kind of spurred her on to, to do more things in the skeptic community. And as you meet more people and learn more things about resources that are available to you, then it just moves you beyond and beyond and you can you can do more things. So one of the things Adrian's doing is working with um, um, an organization up there in Calgary called the Atheist Society of Calgary. And they're gonna be putting on a conference called We Can, we can, we can reason. We can reason. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. We can reason conference that'll be coming up. It keeps getting postponed because of COVID. I, I really hope to, it'll be live because I really want to go to Calgary. I don't want to, because I want to, I'm hopefully going to be able to speak there. It'll be one of the conferences that is coming up. And so I'd like to introduce Adrian. She has uh, done a couple talks that are recorded somewhere on the About Time channel. And this is a topic that I think is so important. I've heard her give this talk a few times. This is going to be a, a condensed version of what she normally gives, but it's an important topic that I think that, um, especially if you uh, have people in school or um, children in school, or if you are a teacher or something of the sort, that I think this will help a lot with uh, ending bullying and um, help bring more understanding to people. It's about the Tourette syndrome. Um, stereotypes and so on. So I'm going to hand this over to Adrian. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. No, I no. am going to find you on my little handy dandy screen. <laughs> I got to go back to gallery and I got to remove my pen and I will find you. Uh, this, this stuff is just amazing. Um, I also want to mention that um, my uh, board is saying that I haven't been uh, mentioning that we are um, taking donations. And if you'd like to uh, donate, we have a donate button somewhere around here. Um, it helps pay for a lot of the, the, the ways of doing this, including we have a full membership for um, Zoom um, to, you know, and, and other things we do as well. So if you'd like to donate, please do so, but not right now while you're listening to Adrian, who's going to <laughs> give us a talk right now. It's all yours, Adrian. All right. I'll share my screen. And hopefully I get the right one this time, Susan. Did I get the right one? Yes. Awesome. All right. So today, as Susan said, I'm going to talk to you about something that's near and dear to my heart. It's uh, called Tourette syndrome, which is highly misunderstood. And, uh, and we're going to talk about what it really looks like along with some of the CAM or complementary and alternative medicine treatments that have been uh, quote unquote studied as treatments for Tourette syndrome. My background is I'm a retired high school math teacher and a mother of these three very handsome boys. Graham is on the left, Troy on the right, have been diagnosed with Tourette syndrome plus, which includes things like obsessive compulsive disorder and other things. And Cameron, my middle boy has very minimal symptoms. They have not in interfered with his education or career. So we never actually got the official diagnosis even though he actually qualifies for the, the label of Tourette syndrome. And I've been giving in-services to teachers, healthcare providers, and community uh, people since 2005. And I provide education and strategies for use at home and in the classroom. And I worked originally with Tourette Canada until 2018. And I presently work with the Tourette OCD Alberta Network where there's a team of experts that vet my materials. And my main vetter is Dr. Tamara Pringshine, who is actually the head of the Tourette Clinic here in Calgary. I also use a book called Tourette Syndrome by David Martino, and he is the director of the Movement Disorder Program at the University of Calgary, and is also a fellow founding member of the Tourette OCD Alberta Network. 
And I also use the uh, DSM-5 or the Di Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version 5. And I just want to give a little note, there's going to be lots of photos in here. I like pictures. Uh, being a teacher, I guess I kind of like that kind of thing. And other than these three here, nobody else has Tourette syndrome. They're just used for illustrative purposes. So what are the myths? The biggest myth that I think I encounter is that people with Tourette syndrome always swear. And only about 10% of people with Tourette syndrome actually have this tick and it's called coprolalia. And it, this is what you see on Oprah Winfrey or on Dr. Phil, but it is actually quite rare. And the thing with Tourette syndrome is, is it never stays the same. So even if they have the swearing tick right now, they may not have it next week or next year. The next myth is that they are cognitively impaired. And it, Tourette syndrome does not affect IQ and people with Tourette syndrome do have the same or often higher IQ, but because of learning disabilities and the tics, it can appear that they have a lower intellect and it's actually not true, they're usually quite bright. And this is a big one, this one can uh, cause some problems because uh, people think it stays the same, but it doesn't. It's normal for a person's symptoms to wax and wane, and this cycle fluctuates week to week, day to day, or even hour to hour. And it's constantly changing, and that's actually what makes this disorder so difficult. This particular myth is probably the biggest one that gets people into trouble. They can, can control their symptoms to some extent, which perpetuates the myth. Think of yawning like this dog is doing or sneezing. You can hold back each of these to some extent, but there are times that we can't hold back no matter how hard we try. And uh, the tics are like that. They, you can hold them for a while, but it's really hard to, and it's at, a, at an extreme cost to hold them in. Think of trying not to scratch a mosquito bite. Imagine if a teacher or parent said, read this book, but you're not allowed to scratch your mosquito bite. It's possible to do, but not much reading or comprehension would get done. The same is true for tics. It is possible to stop many of them, but the focus required is difficult and very draining and is not recommended. And because of this myth, children are punished for doing them. I have seen this in many classrooms, but after being educated, teachers and students do change their reactions. It's pretty incredible, actually. Education is very powerful. And this myth that they live restricted lives, this can be true, especially if it's a very extreme case. Tourette syndrome is, it is a spectrum disorder. So some people have very mild symptoms while others have very severe and debilitating symptoms. And virtually no two cases are alike, but most people with Tourette syndrome can live normal lives. My kids are very successful. They've all grown up to, to do very well. And the last one is that they don't wanna be labeled having Tourette syndrome. And this can be true to some extent and we need to overcome this because it is counterproductive and it will not stigmatize them for life. And I'm gonna actually address this last one first because labels are something that I've been kind of attacked for uh, in my presentations over the course of my career. And even recently I've witnessed people not wanting to be labeled because of stigma. It was an issue when my kids were small, still a concern today. And what they fear is a diagnosis of Tourette syndrome, ADHD, OCD, et cetera, will be much more problematic than helpful. But what they need to understand is that people develop their own labels. And my kids were labeled before Tourette syndrome. They were labeled as behavior. They were weird, lazy. They were refusing to do their work. And actually having labels gave me as a parent a direction and a means to communicate to others and teachers. It opened up the possibilities of strategies instead of punishments. Labels got my kids accommodations all the way through post-secondary school. And I believe we need to use the labels. It's a form of communication is what it is and it reduces stigma. Education is key. So I thank you for listening to me today. Now let's look at what Tourette syndrome really does look like. So the origins come from Gilles de la Tourette. He was a French physician and he lived from 1857 to 1904. And in 1885, he published, published an account of nine patients patients with what he called convulsive tic disorders. It is neurodevelopmental or brain-based. Neuropsychiatric is another term often used. It's genetic. Uh, mostly, most people believe it's mostly genetic, though there are some, uh, some rarer cases that they can't figure out. And it's characterized by tics. And what are tics? That's the big question. Well, they are semi-voluntary. They're not purposeful. Like I talked in the missed slides, tics are not done on purpose. And a unique aspect of tics relative to other movement disorders is that they are suppressible yet irresistible like that mosquito bite. They are experienced as an irresistible urge that must eventually be expressed. 
and they constantly change how they appear and sound. They can be very, very repetitive. I have a friend who said, okay, 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 for three days straight. And they can manifest differently from one person to the other. All three of my sons had very different tics, very different symptoms. And students that I have actually taught all had very different symptoms as well. And this is a big one, they tend to come and go. So there were times where my kids had no tics at all. And sometimes it would go on for like a month. They can wax and wane in number frequency, complexity and severity. To be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, you must have both of these, both a motor tick and a vocal tick, so actions and sounds. And if we're talking motor tics, these ones tend to be simple motor tics are usually less than one second in duration. They can be really quick or slow, violent or gentle, and eye tics are among the most common. Other examples would be nose twitching, abdominal tensing, which you wouldn't actually see, gyrating and bending, so they can be very complex as well. Some can look purposeful, such as copying the motions of others, and less common is giving the finger or grabbing genitals. They do actually happen. It's like a swearing tick. It's, it's about 10% of people with Tourette syndrome, but they can also be harmful. And this is where they can uh, be, you know, this is not fun. And like this little, little fellow here, you can have jaw snap snapping and jaw snapping and hyperextended beyond normal range. There's a fellow in Calgary here who snaps so violently, he actually dislocated his jaw. Rapid head twisting and jerking can result in sore necks. And eye rolling can cause headaches. My youngest son had this. He had a lot of headaches when he was growing up because he had very severe eye rolls. And he also had biting. He, he would bite the tips of his fingers off. But you, sometimes the biting is biting the inside of the, the mouth. So you don't see that happening, but it's very, very painful. Vocal tics are the other component of Tourette syndrome, and they usually appear one to two years after motor tics are noticed. And they're usually simple, but they, we'll talk about complex ones in a minute. And the range of vocal tics is huge. Any noise or sound has the potential to become a tic, and they can be extremely loud and sudden. Uh, some examples would be throat clearing, coughing, whistling, spitting, sucking, yes, spitting, I did say that, hissing, barking, screeching, and uh, uh, for complex vocal tics, those are out of context speech and they could be words, phrases, and statements. And here's some examples that I have actually witnessed. I knew somebody, shut up, that actually had the shut up tick, shut up, and you see how it's out of context. That would be shut up a tick. Uh, my own, Oldest son, Graham, used to say what's for dinner tonight, before school, after school, during dinner, after dinner. And he, it was very specific to me. So ticks can be specific to different people as well as locations. And this particular tick was just for me. And my youngest son did, I love chocolate milk, you're fat. So those are examples of what a tick might sound like. Some of these factors can certainly make them worse, symptoms worse. There's good stress and bad stress. So good stress being a summer break, going on a holiday, uh, a birthday party, bad stress being an exam, work deadlines, those can all increase the tics. Illness is an interesting one because if a person with Tourette syndrome has a cold, when the cold goes away, the cough will stay and can become a tick when the cold is over and it can last for months. And this is probably the most problematic for people with Tourette syndrome. I have a friend, Steve Call, and mentioned him. He was the okay, okay guy. We went to a conference and someone had a tick that said monkey repeatedly, and it made him start to say monkey repeatedly. Uh, in the past, I was asked to present at a school, but not to bring Steve with me because the previous year when I brought him, the, the student started doing Steve's ticks and they were quite painful. So you know, they're very suggestible, the ticks. So what can help ticks? Well, the biggest thing is activities that really require a lot of focus, such as playing a musical instrument. My oldest son plays classical guitar and he doesn't tick at all. Video games, and I quite often get asked about driving. Yes, people can drive because usually it, it requires quite a bit of attention. So what's the occurrence? And hopefully you recognize this fellow. This is Oliver Sachs. And he looked at his first patient in 1971. And what he had read is it was one in a million, but he had apparently seen three examples in an hour out on the street. And the actual occurrence people feel now is about 1% of school-aged children, three times more likely in boys than girls. Don't know why, but both boys and girls have the same symptoms. All ethnic groups can get Tourette syndrome, however, it seems less common in individuals with African and Hispanic descent, but we have to be careful because those differences could be a difference in access to care. 
It tends to peak at age 10 to 12, so during puberty, and I certainly noticed that with my kids, and it can continue into adulthood, though there is a high rate of improvement after puberty. So about a third of people, the tics go away completely or they're really minor. A third, they stay about the same, and a third, they actually increase. My friend Steve was one of the people whose tics increased as he got older. And unfortunately, most youths diagnosed with Tourette syndrome have other disorders, not just the tics. Uh, about, I think it's 75% have at least one of these other disorders and most of them have multiple. So ADHD and obsessive compulsive behaviors are the most common and 70% of people in a study by Cohen and Lechman reported heightened uh, sensitivity to tactile, auditory and our visual stimuli, stimuli. For example, not being able to wear clothing with a tag or you can't handle smells at the bay perfume. Oh, that's Canadian, I shouldn't do that. In the perfume aisle of your store. And I'm going to now talk about the CAM treatments or the complementary and alternative medicine treatments. Unfortunately, these are the most popular treatments that they have found for treating uh, with people with Tourette syndrome because parents are desperate to help their children or themselves. Of concern is that one study of 100 people done at Rush University, 80% of individual, individuals using CAM did not actually report it to their doctors. And if it's homeopathy, we could say, yeah, fine, because it's just water. But other treatments like herbal supplements or cannabis could pose a concern because of potential drug interactions. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a chart that I com compiled from my Tourette syndrome book that went through all the different studies. And uh, we'll take a look at that now. And I want, I think it's kind of funny. I think most of you, if you take a quick look at this, will notice something a little problematic with these charts. Even if you're not a mathematician, you can see the sample sizes are ludicrously low. And some, in fact, there's a couple, watch out for another one, where n equals to one. In other words, it's a single case study. So it, if you look at each of these, I'm just going to go very briefly through them. For relaxation, the first two reports were case reports. The third study was unblinded. So I think you can see some problems there. And there was no convincing evidence of efficacy, even with that. So next, if you look at hypnosis, there's no standardized measures used and several case reports and case series that was potentially useful because there was some positive uh, effects, a lowering of tick frequency, but there are, of course, method methodological limitations again, particularly study sizes and non-standardized measures. With biofeedback training, the, the first case, it, the case study was the first study, the case series using standardized measure for the second study, so a little bit better, potentially useful, but again, uh, these sample sizes were very, very small, so potentially useful, but we need to do a lot more studying. Yoga meditation, no studies at all with regards to that. In fact, I think for some people, it might increase the ticks because they're trying to hold them in. Dietary modification is an interesting one that was a questionnaire only. And so the only interesting finding that I could find with this was that there was a significant correlation found regarding caffeine and ticks. And that kind of makes sense. It's a stimulant. Uh, and often people who are medicated for ADHD, the ticks would get worse. So authors speculated that caffeine could exacerbate the ticks. Omega-3 fatty acids was interesting. This was actually a randomized controlled trial and it but unfortunately, you notice it says negative for the outcome and significant in tick-related impairment measure. What happened was most of the tick scales that were used were negative, but the ones showing uh, an impairment measure actually showed some improvement. So they said potentially useful for, for reduction of impairment, but not severity. The study, one of the study limitations was noted, and I thought this was kind of funny, uh, was that they used for the placebo group it's olive oil. And so because of that, they thought maybe there's a therapeutic value for that as well, as well as the sample size, of course, was small. I'm going to jump down to the one everybody wants to talk about, which is uh, cannabinoids. And this was a randomized control trial with adults. And it was a standard, standardized measures were used, again, really small sample sizes. Gelatin capsules were used in this study. But in a 2009, even though it says it was positive, in 2009 Cochrane Review by Curtis and Rickards, it was found there was uh, not enough evidence to support their use in treatment of ticks or obsessive compulsive behavior. In a more recent view that I found, which was 2018, Kumar et al., it looked at 19 adults with TS and the tick scores decreased by 60%. So very mixed results, but it is not recommended for treating children or adolescents. 
because of brain development issues. So if we look at body manipulation, this is our favorite chiropractic. Uh, I thought this is really funny because it's an N of one, one person, and it says potentially useful, but you know, obviously there's limitations here. And I took a look at the study and what it was, was a, a nine-year-old boy and he had six weeks of treatment and his, tick his ticks completely resolved and remained absent for five months. And so I'm guessing that's why they said it's potentially useful. And that's a guess on my part. And his, he was able to reduce his medication. What I would have been interested in is seeing if when he reached puberty, the symptoms came back. Remember I said they tend to wax and wane. Maybe he just had a really long period where they disappeared. I don't know if five months is normal. I've never heard of one that long. So maybe this is significant, but it definitely needs to be uh, replicated before we make any recommendations. So the next one I'm going to talk about is traditional Chinese medicine, and I, you will notice that only Chinese st studies were positive. There was nothing from the U.S. Or, the, or, or Europe, but we're actually getting up to some better end numbers for sample size. And what they used here was something called Ning Dong in combination with haloperidol, and haloperidol is actually a drug that's used for ticks. And it, the, so it was Ning Dong plus the haloperidol or, versus haloperidol alone, and what they found was there was significant improvement reported in 95% of the treatment group versus 73% of the control group. In the second study, it was only Ning Dong only versus nothing, just a placebo. And oh, sorry, I hit my keys, waving my arms around. And uh, so it, in that study, they showed 41% improvement over the control group, which was 11%. And if you notice, there's been no studies for homeopathy or Ayurveda and no evidence indicated they did not recommend it. Now here is a, something that came up to me from parents many times during my talks. I had parents quite often ask me, have you ever heard of this tick tamer? And notice it's homeopathic and look how much it costs. It's $117 for two ounces. And it's interesting because I could only find this in Canada. In the US, it, I couldn't find it. So I thought that was really interesting. So if you want some, you gotta come to Canada. And the other thing I found, which I thought was really quite awful, uh, this was brought to my attention from a YouTuber with Tourette syndrome, and her name is I Drank the Seawater. And she was understandably outraged with, when she found this, which is a silencer for outbursts. And especially when you can get this adaption to make it into a muzzle. So I, I was quite horrified along with her that this would actually be something sold on Amazon. It, it's available both in Canada and the US if you want to pick one up. Now the real treatment options are pharmacological. I talked about the haloperidol, but a big one that my kids used was were uh, cognitive behavioral interventions. CBIT wasn't around, but we sort of had a version of it. And what that is is cognitive behavioral intervention for ticks. They did a lot of exposure and response, which helped with their tics and cognitive behavioral ther therapy. And it was helpful in painful tics, resolving painful or harmful tics. And I'm just gonna finish off here with a, a fun little cartoon. You should check this fellow's work out. His name is Fish Lee, when neurodiversity meets humor. And it's, uh, uh, you know, it's Tourette syndrome, ruining hide and seek since 1885. And thank you so much for inviting me and uh, the Tourette OCD Alberta Network thanks you for inviting me as well. But before I go, I'm gonna shamelessly plug what Susan also already talked about, which is our Western Canadian Reason Conference, We Can Reason, which of course features Susan Gerbic and Yasmin Mohammed as our keynote speakers, hopefully held May 14th to 15th, 2021, and hopefully in person and if not online. Thank you so much. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Now, this is the third or fourth time I've heard you give a talk, and I learn something new every time. Oh my God. This one was different. Yeah, because, well, it's so hard. Faster. And that talk, I usually, I speak to teachers, I usually speak between an hour and three hours long. So trying to cut it into 20 minutes, it, uh, I don't know. I didn't time myself. I forgot. I always forget to turn oh, the clock. You did. You did good. <laughs> uh, some questions which will be really great yeah you guys um if you want to see her talk in a longer form she has uh done it for the about time project which is on our, our about time channel which hopefully you guys are all over to our youtube channel and subscribing also i believe the video is up or going to be up on the weekend reason yep. it, it should be up 
Yeah. So please put that in the chat. Uh, you get a chat. I have videos. You want a, on you want a little, not quite as much as I gave you last night? Um, oh, yeah. Okay. What? what? I, don't know, I think somebody's unmuted. Somebody but I was going to say the other place you can find the videos is on the TRET OCD um, Alberta Network. Just Google them and it's under the education section. And if you're a teacher, it's got strategies on how to deal with these kids. Uh, as, uh, TRET syndrome and o OCD. Obsessive. So uh, Brandy has asked a couple questions. Um, Brandy's from the uh, Las Vegas uh, skeptic group. Um, since I've heard your talk so many times, I think I could answer them, but I'm not going to even try because I will probably embarrass myself, but I feel like I've learned so much from you with uh, talking about Tourette's. So she's asked two questions. Uh, let me ask the first one first. And she wants to know if it's hard to diagnose. Uh, it's actually pretty straightforward to diagnose, but it can be very difficult to get the diagnosis, if that makes sense. And that's because medical professionals aren't aware of it. In, and of course, my kids are, my oldest is 31 now, and he but he wasn't diagnosed until he was 11, but he had severe tics at age four. So we went all those years seeing people and seeing doctors and nobody actually diagnosed it until we got into a Tourette clinic. And uh, so it's not hard to diagnose because it's very basic. You have to have vocal tics, you have to have motor tics, you have to have them for more, for more than a year and they have to constantly change. That's, that's basically it. So, but it's very difficult to get the diagnosis. And I've met a lot of people who have trouble getting the diagnosis. The second question that Brandy asked was, can a child go all day in a school day possibly without having ticks? I mean, like, yes. I guess intentionally trying not to. Yes, and if they do, they don't get any work done because they have to focus all their energy on holding their ticks in. It would be like us saying, you can't blink. Okay, now you can't blink. We can all hold our eyes open for some time. And eventually some of them will be coming out. They, so maybe some of the more mild ones. And when they go home, they're not gonna be very excited about doing anything and they're wanna, going to wanna sleep or you know, just they, they might have rage episodes, et cetera. So it is not recommended. Uh, Brandy also said, can they stay similar if the ticks? Um, to be uh, diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, they do have to change, but they can last for a couple of years. And usually the ones you want to go away are the ones that stick around, unfortunately. So uh, at least that's what people with Tourette syndrome tell me. So the swearing tick might stay around, but they do tend to change. I found that with my sons, like my, the eye rolling one lasted with my son a couple of years. And I just noticed he's doing it again. He's 22, so it's just come back. But for many years, he did not do that one. But it's I, it, for them to, so they can stay the same, but there's lots of other ones that come and go, if that answers the question. All right, Kelly Burke um, had mentioned, she's now she's a teacher. Yes. She says, that, this is more of a comment. Uh, I see a lot of the same stigmas in education with autism and stimming. This has a lot to do with uh, uh, facilitated communication, I'm thinking too. It's a shame people are so determined to make their kids normal that force them to put all their mental in energies into suppressing these behaviors and the same with the facilitated communication my child must be normal and must be able to communicate must be must be must be i want my kid this way i want my kid this way to be normal to have an average you know it's the same kind of idea just accept your child as they are you know help yes. them as best you can but exactly and and it's interesting you know there's a lot of stigma around particularly things like the swearing tick and yet if you educate the class and you educate the teachers it becomes like a cough in the room and then what happens is the anxiety goes down and then it kind of goes away. So that's, it's the best treatment is just to ignore it. Uh, and of course there's times, what was that? I was just gonna ask you that same thing. Can, if, if it happens, if you, education obviously. Yeah, huge. And uh, just yeah. stress really, act, um, stress In is, is the problem a lot of the times. Yeah. So the so child is feeling really uncomfortable in the situation. Tell the spitting one. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a kid that I knew who in the US who had a spitting tick and but he would have to spit on people so quite often the ticks are very specific and of course that's not acceptable behavior so the class got together to come up with a solution that was acceptable to the kids that they thought would work and so they came up with a, a celebrity he hated and they made a great big life-size Justin Bieber <laughs> <laughs> I made that part up because I couldn't remember who they made. <laughs> I thought it really was Justin Bieber. I'll use Justin Bieber. And uh, they made this cutout with him and he would spit on the cutout instead of people. And it worked really well. So it, you know how I said there's that urge to 
to actually enact this tick. The urge, it's like scratching around a mosquito bite. It sort of satisfies it, but not completely, but it can get them through the day. So, you know, what first un unacceptable ticks, that's, that's okay. Brandy also asks if a kid is, was never diagnosed and seems to have things under control, <laughs> is it still worth getting a diagnosis? No, and that was my middle boy. My, my middle boy, we never bothered with a diagnosis. And it was really funny because when we moved to Calgary, the psychiatrist wanted to see all my kids, all three of them before we moved because moving can be quite traumatic for kids with Tourette syndrome. And so he saw my middle boy for the first time and he pulled me aside and said, do you realize, Cam, it has ticks? And I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> and he says, why haven't you brought him to me? Oh, because he's getting straight A's in school. He's got friends and, you know, there's, there's no issues. And he goes, okay. And he just said, if anything changes, let me know and we'll see him. So, you know, yeah. So if, they, if they're functioning fine in school, at home, with their friends, there's no need for a diagnosis. Okay, Mark has a question. Hi. Oh. <laughs> he pops it out of the corner. <laughs> Here he is. So I, it seems kind of obvious, but uh, is there any link between Tourette's and alcoholism? Ooh, you know, I've never read anything about it. Because my brother was an alcoholic and he would just have these instances where he would just yell as loud as he could. And I mean, that's normal for a drunk, but <laughs> it was, sometimes it was just kind of out of the blue, you know? Well, in a thing, restaurant, you would just erupt. Well, what's interesting, though, is I do know that alcohol, if you have Tourette syndrome, will make the symptoms worse because it's a disinhibition disorder. And what does alcohol do? It, right. It's more disinhibition. Well, that so makes my sense. To not drink alcohol. And if they oh. do, have one drink. Yeah. Because they don't want their tics to get worse. Very good. Obvious again, but I just thought I would ask. Thanks. So maybe one doesn't lead. It, it isn't correlated but it just can correct it it just, it, it, it's sort of like having adhd medications with people with Tourette syndrome it makes the ticks worse the adhd gets better but the ticks will get worse so it, you know it's a real balancing act when they have both mm -hmm. avi says uh what do you think of the movie phoebe think of the movie phoebe in wonderland i don't think i've seen the that one about a child with Tourette's. I haven't seen another one I'm going to have to put on my list because uh, the last time I talked with you, Susan, they asked me about Motherless Brooklyn and I had to go watch that. And it was you great. recommend it all the time. It's on my list, Motherless yeah. Brooklyn. So what was it again? Uh, uh, I guess Phoebe I can... in Wonderland, P-H-O-E-B. -E I will look it up. Thank you, Abby. Okay. And Deborah said, some of the ticks seem to be things that people, wait, some of the ticks seem to be things that will draw attention from other people often negative is there any behavioral connection there particularly as it might affect the content words gestures does a person choose the words for instance oh that's an interesting one that's a really interesting question unfortunately no they don't cho choose the words and in fact quite often they're nonsensical my oldest son would always say doodle and so we would say hey this is our son graham he'd go doodle hey how you doing uh so they they don't really choose them they just kind of happen and uh, and if they could choose them they wouldn't be swearing you know that's one of the ones because it's very embarrassing for most kids and the grabbing genitals or doing you know the finger kind of thing those are very embarrassing particularly if they're in elementary school and usually, as I say, they're very suggestible. So what happens is they hear the word on the playground, they know that it's something they're not supposed to say. And then their brain just says, no, nope, here it comes. So, right. there's no so, advice. so they, would, no they would say a swear word, knowing that it is a swear word, yeah. necessarily, yeah. or something. And like quite that. often, if they have the coprolalia, they also do say racial slurs as well. So it's usually a like a run of words that are all really nasty. Boy, that can't be... Boy, that must be stressful. It's very stressful. I, I, I went into a school where the student, every time there's a black kid in the in the class, and every time he saw him, he would say the N-word. So, you know, as I say, it can be very situational. And he knows that that's not appropriate. This this kid was devastated, did not want to be saying it. And But once we, I went in and educated, everybody seemed to, to do a lot better. And the kids, you know, I, I keep getting feedback where kids, the, the bullying stops, it goes away. People will come up to them and say, now I understand why you do these awful things. Right. right. Or, you know, and inappropriate to things. The, to, to the labeling, I think it was Lisa that said that um, labeling is so important because at least it gives you a, 
something to say that it's not just, they're not doing it on purpose necessarily. Right. It's not for attention, yeah. but That's um, right. yeah. So very good. Okay, you guys, I really have to end this because we're a couple minutes over, even though I've been really good. We've been really, really good at staying on time. If you want to listen to more of Adrian talk about Tourette syndrome, you can find it on our, our YouTube channel, the About Time channel, and also on her channel, which is the um, Tourette OCD Alberta Network. Okay. So you can hear more from her. She also has done a talk on GSOW editing and how she started out in the skeptic movement, oh, haunted you. house page and so on. It's very interesting listening to Adrian. I really appreciate you giving us <laughs> much of your time. Um, she's, she's going to be hanging around a little bit longer too. And um, so uh, we can ask her more questions later if you really want to. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I, I learned something new from her. I'm, I'm telling you all the time. It's so wonderful learning about her. And again, she's a DSOW editor, but she's able to bring her own expertise in a completely different area that has nothing to do with uh, Wikipedia necessarily.